Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, you know, you know when you've really hit the big time is when nobody introduces you. Um, you need you serious. You know when they always say needs no introduction. I got no introduction. <laughs> so uh, I'm Steve Sedman. I'm the deputy director of the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law. Um, and for the last year, uh, I was the secretary general of the Kofi Annan Commission on elections and democracy in the digital age. Um, I'm going to walk you through uh, the findings uh, of the commission's report today, uh, and then we're going to have a, a Q&A uh, with uh, Kelly Bourne, who's the executive director of the Cyber Policy Center, and Nate Persley, who is one of my commissioners and is one of the faculty directors at the Cyber Policy Center. And then we'll open it up to questions uh, from the audience. So this, is the, this was actually the third time that I had run a commission for Kofi Annan. Um, once when, uh, when he was actually Secretary General at the UN, uh, I ran a commission on reforming the UN. Um, that was really successful. Um, the second time was after he had retired. Um, I worked for him on a commission that was on promoting and protecting uh, the integrity of elections worldwide. And then in about 2018, uh, he called me and said that uh, he was very concerned at what was happening uh, in the world regarding uh, social media, hate speech, disinformation, what had happened in the American elections in 2016, what had happened with Brexit. Um, and he asked me what I thought about whether, you know, would it be valuable to have uh, a commission that looked at the effects of social media on uh, democracy and in particular the integrity of elections. Um, he then came to Stanford in May of 2018. Uh, Nate and I helped put together uh, a dinner for him with uh, various people from the Valley. Uh, he continued these discussions, and then he decided that he was going to go ahead uh, with this commission. Um, one piece of advice I gave him was that if you did a commission like this on social media, you could not have uh, a bunch of 75 and 80-year-old former heads of state as your commissioners. Not that there's anything wrong with 75 and 80-year-old former heads of state as commissioners. That was his typical uh, uh, group, sort of target group for these kinds of commissions, but I said, actually, this time um, you've got to go out and you have to find people who know something about technology, who know something about the business, and who know something about how this uh, affects politics uh, in outside of Europe and the United States. So he put together a, a panel, a commission, uh, in the end, 10 commissioners um, from around the world. Um, with experience, some like Alex Stamos, who was a former security, chief security officer at Facebook. Um, others uh, who were former heads of state, um, our chair was Laura Chinchilla, the former uh, president of Costa Rica. Uh, the vice chair was Yves Leterme, the former prime minister of Belgium. Um, but there, there, there was geographical balance and gender balance, and uh, it was a younger and, and uh, I think more knowledgeable commission than you often find in these kinds of exercises. Um, I agreed to, to direct the, the commission two weeks before Kofi died. Um, and uh, the foundation, the Kofi Annan Foundation, very much wanted it to go forward as a, as a legacy, as, a, as part of his legacy, as a, as a memorial to him. Um, and so we started uh, work in earnest uh, in the fall of 2018, um, and last year we met three times uh, and had consultations in various parts around the world. Um, so let me walk you through uh, some of the findings, some of the recommendations, and then we'll have the, our discussion. Um, now when we started uh, our work, um, you know, you have a lot of uh, things that are said about social media in, uh, in the media, in, in newspapers. A lot of people have opinions about this. Um, and you have a lot of claims about it. 
you have claims that you know, social media causes polarization, social media causes distrust, social media uh, is responsible for the decline of political parties, um, social media creates filter bubbles and echo chambers which harms democratic deliberation. There's a lot of claims that are out there. And uh, so for the last year, we've been trying to be empirically driven actually to look at, well, what, is, you know, what does the research say? Um, and what we found is that um, for many of the things that are claimed about digital technologies, many of the ills that are ascribed to digital technologies, um, actually um, what you see is that they predate the intervention, of, the, the invention of social media, invention of the internet. So you take something like polarization. Well, if you look at uh, polarization in the United States, whether you measure it in terms of cooperation in Congress or effective polarization, how partisans think of each other, um, you see polarization actually starting in the mid-70s and going on pretty much uh, uh, a linear uh, climb. Um, again, before you have the internet, uh, before you have social media, before you have the smartphone, et cetera, uh, you look at something like distrust, distrust in government, um, distrust in fellow citizens, uh, similar kinds of things around the world that oftentimes there has been a decline in trust, but again, predating um, the, the, the internet, predating social media. Uh, similarly, the decline of political parties is a trend that comparativists will tell you starts you know, in the 1980s. Uh, for a whole bunch of different reasons. So what we found is that um, in some cases there was little evidence to support many of the negative claims. Sometimes there were con contradictory findings and frankly some questions were unanswerable given the lack of data sharing of the platforms. But what we did find is that um, in terms of a threat to electoral integrity there is no question that weaponized disinformation and weaponized hate speech can threaten electoral integrity. Um, and a useful way of, of thinking about it is that in countries where you have pre-existing polarization, when you have pre-existing polarization, when you have pre-existing uh, distrust in society, where you have hyper-partisan media, those democracies are going to be especially vulnerable to network propaganda so that if you look at the United States, for instance, again, uh, many of the, the, the things that we think about disinformation and uh, network propaganda are the result of 30 years of polarization, the effects of partisan media, including hate radio, including Fox News. Um, it is the, the, the larger informational ecosystem has made America particularly vulnerable to this. Now, the problem is what I've just described, what I've just described is true of a lot, lots of places in the global south. Um, again, pre-existing polarization, high distrust, uh, partisan media, right? That when you have those three things, you are particularly vulnerable to social media. And when you look for indicators trying to measure uh, effective polarization, for instance, um, you find that on, on some scores, the United States is actually similar to cases like Brazil or Mexico, or India, or Hungary than it is to uh, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, et cetera. So that we're actually closer on some of these dimensions to democracies in the global south than uh, tradition, some traditional democracies in Europe. Um, what it means is, uh, we say, is that um, you know, the countries of the global south are going to be particularly vulnerable uh, to weaponized disinformation. Elections are going to become focal points for this kind of propaganda, for disinformation, for weaponized hate speech. Um, and that if you care about electoral integrity in the world, this is something that you're really going to have to pay attention to uh, because the potential for democratic rollback and also violence are going to be very high. Uh, in a lot of places in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, the other thing that we found was that when, uh, when weaponized disinformation has an impact, it's not just a problem of the platforms. Um, now, it is easy to blame the platforms for a whole bunch of different ills. Um, um, and we 
discuss some of this in the report, there's a lot of things that they're responsible for. But when you see the kind of weaponized disinformation have effects, like in the United States um, and elsewhere, India, Brazil, it's a problem of the platforms. It's often a problem of traditional media, which is hyperpartisan. It's often a problem of very irresponsible politicians who spread the disinformation. Um, now, this is not in our report. I'm just going to I'm just going to cite uh, Yohai Benkler, but uh, professor of law at, at Harvard, when he says, you know, what are, what are the biggest sources of disinformation in the United States? You know, he said it's not Breitbart, it's not Infowars, it's Fox News, and it's the President of the United States and the coterie around the President that does an enormous amount of spreading of disinformation, rumor, conspiracy, right, propaganda. So, um, any solution that you're going to put forward on this has got to be systematic. Um, it's got to try to build resilience in societies. Um, one thing that we don't get, go into but is obvious from what I'm saying is if polarization is playing a large role in this equation, then there's a whole bunch of things that, that are going to ha that's going to have to take place in societies to try to reduce polarization. We, don't, we mentioned a few of those things, but that's not the focus of, of, of our report. Um, so we talk about um, several things. We talk about building capacity. We talk about uh, uh, building, uh, creating norms. We talk about things that platforms can do. We talk about things that, that public authorities can do. Um, we, uh, throughout the report, we have different chapters that address issues of hate speech, issues of weaponized disinformation, issues of political advertising, issues, issues of foreign interference, um, and uh, issues of protecting electoral infrastructure. Um, in the report, uh, again, we, um, since we only had a year to do our w work, we very much focused on this question of electoral integrity. Um, and by electoral integrity, we mean both that the actual integrity, that everybody's vote matters, is counted, um, uh, but also perceived, perceived integrity, beliefs that people feel that um, the election has been above board, everybody's vote has been counted accurately, um, uh, that, that it actually is a legitimate election. Um, and then we also talk an, about an element of electoral integrity having to do what we, what we call creating a mutual security system. That is the belief that in a democracy, elections are not one-off episodes, but are part of a continuing uh, iterative game that goes, goes on into the future. So that if you lose an election, your expectation should be that we are going to come back, we'll have a chance to regroup, we'll have a chance to campaign, um, and run again in the future, right? If you start to believe that if you lose this election, you will be out of power forever, that's no longer going to be an iterated game with a long shadow of the future, but all of a sudden there's going to be all kinds of incentives to cheat, uh, incentives for violence, and so forth. So this is a set of beliefs that become very important, and, and we keep coming back to it in the report. All right, so what do we say? Capacity. Uh, first of all, uh, we think that there's room for building what we call an election vulnerability index. Uh, in the 80 or so elections that are going to take place in the world, um, what, are the, what are the elections that are going to be most vulnerable to weaponized disinformation? Uh, we say to the democracy, the electoral integrity community, that it should fund civil society and national partnerships that counter hate speech and disinformation. Fortunately, we found examples from around the world. Um, there's a great example from Mexico called Verificado. This was a civil society initiative that had very good cooperation from the platforms, and it, was, uh, it functioned as a way of countering disinformation uh, and misinformation. Um, a similar exercise was done in Indonesia in the run-up to their elections. So we have these examples in the rest of the world um, of civil society, electoral management bodies, traditional media, all coming together to try to fight this stuff. Um, and we think that this is something that should be supported. Um, we need, uh, again, to make sure that electoral management bodies around the world, uh, in, 
including in this country, uh, practice uh, sort of best cyber practice, that they're actually knowledgeable, that they're capable, that they have capacity. Um, we talk about creating uh, somewhere in the international system, whether it be at the UN, but more, more likely at regional organization levels, um, sort of electoral cybersecurity teams um, that could be sent to uh, anywhere in the world where an election management body, let's say in a country in Africa, uh, notices that or w is worried about either um, weaponized misinformation, weaponized disinformation, or they're worried about hate speech, or they're, or they're actually worried about hacking into their systems, they can call on a capacity that can come uh, and assist them. In terms of norms, we talk about um, the importance of candidate pledges and PACs to reject deceptive digital practices. Um, this is something that uh, has been recommended for European elections um, and has been done on an election by election basis in some places uh, in Africa, for instance. Kofi Annan in 2015 negotiated in Nigeria something called the Abuja Accord, which tried to bring all of the political candidates together to reject deceptive campaigning and deceptive advertising. Um, and we think that these, these are good things. Um, we think that the democratic governments of the world uh, no, notice I'm not saying all governments, and I'm not saying the United Nations, I'm not saying universal governments, I'm saying democratic governments um, should come together and develop guidelines on proper democratic assistance. What is proper democratic assistance versus uh, electoral interference and manipulation? Um, this is to counter the rise of the sort of uh, what about narrative uh, of somebody like Putin who loves to say, well, what about the color revolutions? Isn't, isn't what we're doing, you know, of course we didn't do it, but if we had done it, it wouldn't have been as bad because you did all this stuff in terms of assisting uh, democratic elections in Ukraine and elsewhere. Um, and uh, we believe that democratic governments uh, could have a role here in, in basically spelling out what are the norms of, of uh, sort of proper democratic assistance versus what is electoral interference. Um, we believe that uh, uh, there's room internationally to, to develop codes of conduct for the vendors of uh, election hardware and software support. Um, this was something that was very much desired by several of our commissioners from the Global South. Um, they feel that especially as governments move to electronic elect election technologies, they feel that uh, citizens have, a lot, have, have lost confidence in a lot of the equipment and procedures of carrying out elections. Um, there's, all, there's been all kinds of uh, scandals involving procurement of election technology, um, and that this would be a way if you could come up with standards of uh, corporate standards for these vendors and have some, have some governments hold them accountable would be a good thing. Similarly, uh, we would like to see codes of conduct developed for political campaign consultants, transnational political campaign consultants. Uh, something like Cambridge Analytica has gone out of business, but Cambridge Analytica wannabes are all around the world, um, and they're still wreaking havoc on various countries in the global south. Um, and it's, it's very odd when you think about it that something like uh, campaign management as well as the equipment that goes, the hardware and the software that goes into elections are absolutely essential for electoral integrity, but neither one of these are regulated industries internationally. So we're, uh, as a step to getting there, we think that codes of conduct could be very valuable. Um, in terms of uh, specific steps by public authorities, uh, uh, first thing that we say is that uh, public authorities should compel the platforms to share uh, protected data with certified academic researchers. Uh, the fact of the matter is we kept running into problems where you can't resolve them unless you actually have the data. I'll just give one example because it's in the report. Um, YouTube, for instance, YouTube's algorithms are said to uh, radicalize young men and send them immediately into uh, 
a rabbit hole of far right content and is very successful in terms of surrounding them with that content and, that they, and, and, and getting a grasp on them and they can't escape. That's, that's essentially the, the, the version that's been put forward on the cover of the New York Times. Um, and then there is a counter to that that says, actually, it's not the algorithm doing the work here. It's really demand that's doing the work. Um, and it's not an algorithm problem at all. Now, we can't solve that unless you actually have data shared by YouTube, um, especially in terms of how people interact with the, the algorithm and how the algorithm interacts with individuals. Um, so this is just one example where uh, because the stakes are so high, the stakes are so high for democracy and electoral integrity, um, we say this is something where governments should compel uh, the platforms to share data. Nate has been involved in this uh, for the last two years? Yeah, two years with Facebook. It's been a very slow uh, uh, slog uh, on that score. Um, Governments should uh, compel platforms to label accounts that use automation uh, with threats of fines. Um, governments should step forward and actually define what political advertising is. Um, they should compel platforms to share their info ad purchases. Um, to deal with micro-targeting, they should set minimum targeting size audiences. Um, we think that uh, for when it comes to political advertising, governments should uh, use a 48-hour cooling off period with uh, uh, no political advertising before elections. Uh, some countries, especially in Europe, do that. Um, and finally, that public authorities should develop um, digital media literacy and public interest programming uh, on this. Um, finally, the platforms. Uh, there are things that we ask of the platforms. Um, first, again, having to do with political advertising. Um, this has been in the news. Um, it's been very controversial about political advertising. Um, Twitter at one point says that we're getting out of political advertising. They got a lot of pushback uh, from civil society saying, well, you, you know, maybe you want to get rid of candidate ads, but you don't want to get rid of issue ads. Uh, they had to do a rethink on this. Um, Facebook uh, announced after a speech by Mark Zuckerberg that uh, they were not going to hold political advertising to the same standards as community standards. Um, uh, so that sort of anything goes because that's the rough and tumble of democratic politics and they don't want to be the one to decide what should and shouldn't be a responsible or reasonable uh, political ad. Um, so we say to the platforms, uh, first of all, we, uh, we think that you should require political advertising uh, to be either opt-in or opt-out. You, you should actually ask your consumers whether they want to receive political advertising or not and make them uh, choose. Um, but, we, but one way out we thought for uh, Facebook uh, would be that uh, for political advertising, if you're going to accept political advertising, that you should require candidates uh, or uh, political parties to sign pledges of ethical digital advertising. And then you could use that pledge as your decision as to whether the content that they give you actually meets the pledge that they make uh, to uh, advertise ethically. And if the answer is no, then you don't accept that advertising. Or if they run an ad that runs afoul of their own pledges, to not use uh, deceptive advertising, you can then take it down. Um, there needs to be public disclosure of the identity of individuals actually buying ads. Um, we also say to the platforms, we, we need better early warning systems when it comes to weaponized disinformation and hate speech. Um, in parts of the world where they work, in the global south, this would entail hiring more employees with cultural competency and local language. Uh, we endorse an idea that's called sort of speed bumps on the digital highway, which is an automatic trigger of human review based on uh, the virality uh, of any kind of uh, message. Uh, there needs to be human review of threatening content. Um, and finally, we believe that the platforms uh, should create a coalition and cooperate in addressing threats to electoral integrity akin to what they've done in addressing uh, uh, child pornography or terrorism. That uh, this is an area in which they should extend their cooperation uh, and work together across platforms to deal with the threat. 
Okay, I'm gonna stop there. We're gonna come up and uh, Kelly will take over. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. I've been looking forward to this. I actually remember in May when Kofi Annan in 2018 was coming out here and doing those dinners on Sand Hill Road, so it's fun to see this all kind of coming um, full circle. I think two additional points that you didn't touch on that I wanted to quickly highlight that I thought were really interesting in the report because they run counter to, I think, sort of traditional intuition around this. And then I had four or five questions for you guys and then wanted to save at least 30 or 40 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, I think you mentioned the, the point that a lot of the ills that we attribute to social media actually really predate not just social media, but even the internet in, in some instances, and I think that's important. I think the other thing that is interesting from a comparativist perspective, and Larry Diamond would appreciate this, was the finding that the US ranked, I think it was 98th in terms of public debate that is respectful, built on facts and where opponents are open to persuasion by reason. And I think sometimes we look uh, you know, at, at Brexit and at the sort of overall democratic decline and recession globally, and we think, well, maybe we're not so bad from a comparative perspective, but it sounds like uh, we are. Uh, and that was, <laughs> that was sobering. Um, I think another point that came up that was counterintuitive was this idea of, of sort of contact theory applied to the online world. And so when we think about the solution set, one that came up a lot, especially in the early days, if you'll remember like the 2016 era was, well, what if we could just expose people to more content from an opposing ideological viewpoint? So I'm a Republican and you're a Democrat and if we just sort of sit down and have tea together, that's gonna have a sort of humanizing and moderating effect. And so you saw this proliferation of nonprofit efforts that were trying to do something like that. And I thought what was interesting to see from your report, and I know Shanto Iyengar here is coming out with something along these lines as well, was the point that actually, especially for strong partisans, if I have a perspective on, say, climate change and you expose me to counter attitudinal information about that, not only does contact theory not hold, uh, but it actually just pisses me off more. And so, which is sort of intuitive, I think, but, but I think it raises this interesting point that a lot of the solutions we think about uh, having worked offline, are they really gonna hold in the online world? And I feel like so often you see people trying to take these old ideas and paradigms and apply them here, um, and I think it raises interesting questions. So, uh, so those, those points stuck out to me in particular. Um, wanted to jump in now. You just went through a lot of different uh, recommendations for governments, for platforms, some touching on citizens. Were there two or three that I'd like to ask each of you that, that really stuck out? For me, the idea of labeling bots, I think, was a very interesting one because up until now, you've heard a lot around, well, maybe we should just take down bots altogether. And I think, A, that's really hard to do. As soon as the platforms can find one way of identifying them, it's an arms race and the bot Creators change. <laughs> that was Russia. It's a bot. Yeah. No, it was yeah, a it bot. Was a bot it was call. A bot. Too, it's true. Um, so, so I think this idea of well, we should just take down bots is complicated by you know. I, I think Nick Pickles at Twitter one point told me you know he could they could detect about sixty percent. Uh, of bots, and that's changing all the time in this sort of arms race of, of developing different techniques. A, and then B, there are a lot of good bots out there, and so taking, you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater is, I think, a tricky one. Uh, or people have talked a lot about, well, let's just get rid of anonymity uh, online, uh, also harder to do and, and tricky in, I think, authoritarian context. Right. So I love this idea of labeling. What were the two or three others that really stood out to both of you? Why don't you start? Nate, do you want well, let, me, let me try to, uh, summarize a little bit the way I think about the recommendations in this report, which is that they are under sort of three different families, which is that the recommendations about information, uh, collaboration, and regulation. And so uh, there is a sense, you know, from all of, the, all of us in the kind of panic community when it comes to democracy and the internet. Is that the community that yeah, we're I'm, in? I'm in that community. You can decide whether you are. Um, that we, we actually understand, we know what the problems are, we know their prevalence, right? But part of it is that we are, you know, 
those in the NGO community as well as governments were to some extent legislating in the dark, right? We really don't know the extent of some of these problems, uh, the likelihood that people are, are being confronted by disinformation, hate speech, the heterogeneity in the world, right, as to countries uh, that are, are uh, different populations that are subject to this. One thing that I think Steve emphasized is that we are, <coughs> the, the, one of the unique uh, focuses of this report, right, is to look at the global south. We haven't had, there are plenty of these kind of transatlantic uh, community, or the, the transatlantic organizations that are looking at disinformation, regulating the internet and the like. Uh, this, this report, which was led by uh, Laura Chinchilla, the former president of um, Costa Rica, tries to focus uh, on the, the global south. And uh, we know even less about what's happening there, right? Um, you, you, we hear stories, the worst case uh, stories of things that are happening in Myanmar, Sri Lanka and the like when they make it way onto the New York Times. But what we desperately need is better information about what's actually happening. And that information is locked up in a few companies not too far from here, right? And so not only do we say that they have to turn them over, we think they should, they need to be legally compelled to turn over some of this information uh, to nonpartisan uh, 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 researchers, uh, even sanctioned by uh, some of the democratic governments and the like, uh, we can talk a little bit about that. As, as, as Steve mentioned, I've been working on this for the last two years. We had a mini breakthrough with Facebook in the last month, um, but it's, it's to deal with these problems, we are going to get, have to get some kind of independent body to have the access to the information that the scientists inside the companies have. That's first on, on information. Uh, related to that is what, what Steve was talking about in, in creating an election vulnerability index, right? It's not enough just to have the information. We have to develop some kind of strategy on identifying the problem areas. And the vulnerabilities, right, are on particularly foreign in, in, interference uh, in, in domestic elections, um, uh, disinformation, uh, hate speech, and the like, hate speech that would lead to violence, right? And so uh, once you develop that, that uh, index, then that leads to the second group of uh, recommendations about collaboration, right? We need collaboration among democratic governments to deal with these, with these problems. Um, a lot of what we, we describe in the report are, is norm creation and just agreements. Sometimes we just need an answer. It's not as important what the particular answer is. So for example, as Steve mentioned, you might think in the context of the United States that we should you know, ban foreign uh, governments from having an impact on our elections or something, since that's the way that we uh, you know, think about it with the Russian incursion. Um, but it really is a difficult question of how you should think about, for example, foreign media entities in domestic elections. Should we think about RT and Sputnik in the same way that we think about the BBC or um, uh, you know, a Canadian broadcasting company or the like? Um, and should the say, should, if we develop some kind of norms for them, would we want them applied to Voice of America, let alone to NGOs right, that are working in different locations? And so this is an area where we need the democratic uh, sort of countries to come together to establish norms. In addition to, to collaboration among the, the governments in, in that realm, we also, as, as Steve mentioned, need collaboration when it comes to certification of the election technology vendors. This is something that we are familiar with here in the United States now as a lot of um, you know, uh, counties and uh, states are grappling with the questions about electronic voting machines. But in the developing world, they are really at the uh, mercy of a lot of these uh, companies that are, are selling the basic mechanics of election uh, equipment, right? I mean, uh, if it, it, it's bad enough of what happened in Iowa. Rem imagine if it was happening you know, in, in 25 countries that really don't even have the resources that Iowa has. Um, Related to that is also this question of how do we certify election consultants, right? How do we think about the, the kind of proto-Cambridge Analyticas in this uh, new information age? And, and I think that that's something that we need greater agreement on democratic countries. In addition to government collaboration, though, we need collaboration among the social media companies. As Steve said, we need to start thinking about election interference in the same way that we think of child endangerment and, and terrorism. And um, they do sort of have a lot of uh, cross-pollination, and we should not assume that this is not happening, but we need to formalize it. Um, some work that we've done, my colleague Rob Reich, who leads the project in Democracy on the Internet with me, uh, talks about a model like FINRA, where, where you have some kind of government uh, organized effort among the social media companies. FINRA is, is the 
sort of association of Wall Street banks and the like that deals with financial regulation. But we need to think about an organized system of collaboration between the major tech companies to deal with uh, election interference. And then finally, we need, uh, I've already mentioned some of the regulations. Steve mentioned political ads. There are certain questions like what is a political ad that we need democracies themselves to make that decision, right? Each one of the firms is just casting about for some kind of information here as to what the right answer is. Um, he talked about bot disclosure, as did Kelly. I think the bot disclosure problem is actually a really challenging one, but we think that, this, that the platforms, at a minimum, have to make efforts to uh, reveal what the bots are. One, just to give you a little footnote on that, why is it so hard? One thing you worry about is if you have a kind of inadequate bot detection regime, you will end up giving um, unearned credibility to the bots that you don't catch, right? And so you worry about uh, uh, false positives and false negatives uh, when you when you have that bot detection program. Uh, and then uh, finally, as I mentioned before, that the governments need to uh, uh, start taking all aspects of the technological ecosystem of elections from uh, the voting machines to you know, each you know, voter registration systems and the like and, and, and start certifying them under sort of expected standards. So that was, you asked for three, you three recommendations, but I gave you, you know, th this is the same way that like when a law professor in a faculty It's meeting, all a package. You no, know, they, say, they say, you know, I, I, have, I have one point to make with, with 27 <laughs> parts. And so I've, uh, you, you really liked your parts. recommendations. Yeah. Is so what there, I mean. yeah. Anything so, that you would add? Yeah, no, I, so I actually do have a favorite. Um, is it one or does it have 27 No, it ha you know, it's really one. It's, it's, um, it's the situation that we've gotten into in terms of political advertising right now. Um, I think, uh, if just on the trends that we're on right now, nothing is done, right? Um, this is just going to be a sewer this year. 2020 in the United States, this is just going to be a political sewer. And, and if we don't get a handle on this stuff, the amount of deception, the amount of unethical practices are just going to be appalling, and it's going to be every day. It's already started. I mean, it's already started. Um, now, you know, we could put it all on Facebook to say, you figure it out and take stuff down, and, and, and Mark Zuckerberg has made it very clear they're not going to do that. It's, and then, in fact, they've gone the other direction, which I think is a really unhelpful direction, which is to say, we're actually not going to get into this at all. It's not for us to determine you know, in, in political advertising what's clean, what's not clean. Um, let voters decide this is just the rough and, tu rough and tumble of democratic politics. I think it just ignores the moment that we're in in terms of the intense polarization and the, and the intense use of, of deception. Um, and so the idea that you know, if you're going to take money for advertising, and it's not a big part of their business, it's tiny, but if you're going to take money for advertising, then you can say to you know, candidates, um, okay, we want you to have some ethical standards about your advertising. Um, this is akin to, since, since you know, we've all had, had kids in, in, in you know, youth sports, you, know, you have to sign a thing that says, as a parent, you're not going to be unruly at games. You're not going to swear at the umpires, right? And if you do, they can toss you out, mm -hmm. right? So this, we're just taking that idea, and we're going to you know, transplant it to political advertising to say, OK, if we're going to accept your political ad, uh, money for your political ad, um, you have to agree that you're not going to use deep fakes, you're not going to use shallow fakes, you're not going to use hacked material, there's a bunch of stuff you're just not going to use, right, that are ethical digital advertising practices. Mm -hmm. And if you do, then we're not going to take your money. That's not a big thing, but it raises, at a, at a time we desperately need in our politics to actually raise the ethical standard, it would do that instead of actually lowering it. Okay, so I love the topic of political ads because it's so complicated even in terms of how you define them. Um, three questions that come up for me for both of you on this. One is, how big of a problem really is the political ad component? Because I think so much of this is really organic content and that we keep touching on political ads maybe for two reasons. One, we actually have some precedent for how to regulate this thanks to the FEC, so there's something that's known about how to do this. And then second, you know, my understanding is that these can, that, that when 
groups like the IRA or DD are using political ads, it's really pretty early on to sort of build audiences and that can be a way to get a foothold, but then once the cat's out of the bag, it, it, it's much more challenging. So one question is, how much do political ads matter? Why are we talking so much about this? Is it just because we have some regulatory framework? Um, I think a second, you know, you bring up this idea of pledges, uh, which I think is an interesting one. I've seen pledges fail because it's a, the candidates who, there are some candidates who take them and then don't. So the idea mm -hmm. of, of actually tying that to the ability to place an ad, which is what I'm understanding mm -hmm. you say is, is that Facebook wouldn't take it if you don't take the pledge. Mm -hmm. And then the monitoring of that, I think, is a really interesting question. And then the last one is each of the platforms have come at this so differently. To your point, Facebook, it's like a wild west, but they'll have an archive, which is not terribly functional as I understand it. You know, Twitter's gone back and forth. I understand that Google has said we will allow for both political and issue ads, but we're gonna limit the extent to which you can target based on political ideology or geography. So how big a problem is it? Which platform is doing it better? Do we really think a pledge can work? So let me start on the how big a problem is it? And the answer is we don't really know. Um, and one of the things that we admonish governments here is that they need to at least update their um, advertising regimes to uh, uh, update them to the digital era. So um, the United States is far out on a limb when it comes to political advertising. I mean, I mean, something like I, 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 I'm going to make up this number, so don't quote me, especially if watching the, the, the recording here, but it's going to be something along the lines of 80% of online political advertising in the world is produced in the United States because we do, because most countries regulate political advertising a lot more than we do um, uh, because they have you know free airtime and they because they have party systems right here at every level of government you've got people who who are buying Facebook ads so so it's a huge share of the total amount of money that's that's being spent worldwide is being uh, spent in the U.S. Now that's that's not a response to your question, it, but it's trying to say but it that is a fun fact. A unique, yes, it's uh, really different. Of, um, uh, it's a uniquely American problem, but it's not going to be as um, you know other countries start normalizing uh, the use of uh, the internet for political advertising. So it, w one thing we didn't mention was that at a minimum they need to update the regulations for the information age, and the new digital technologies. Um, second question. All right, what, how big a problem is it? And the question is, well, which problem are you focusing on, right? So, so um, how, much, how important is digital advertising to polarization and hate speech? How important is it to foreign interference in elections? How important is it to uh, disinformation? The, uh, with respect to polarization, right, Yes, there, particularly when it comes to outside advertisers, they are more like, which is to say non-candidate advertising, they are more likely to engage in unaccountable, quite polarizing messages. How big a deal with, is that in terms of the, all, the panoply of forces that are affecting polarization in the U.S.? It's got to be small just because there's so many things that are happening organically, as you said, or you know, just from our political leaders when they, when they speak that are, that are leading to polarization, but it's a component. It's no accident that when the Russians did run ads, right, um, over 75% of them were on polarizing social issues, right? Black Lives Matter, anti-Muslim, anti-immigration uh, types of uh, topics and the like. And so, so there's, there's the polarization component. Just on this foreign, foreign intervention issue, you're right, that a lot of what the ads do is uh, create audiences who then can be targeted with organic content in, in different ways. Um, and so that has to be um, looked at as part of the larger problem of foreign interference in domestic elections, the role of advertising in that. But, you know, the, 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 if you look at the Mueller report, right, it's roughly $100,000 uh, the Russians were spending on Facebook ads, right? If you can swing a U.S. election with $100,000, there are a lot of stupid consultants in Washington who have been overcharging their clients, right, for years and years, <laughs> right? And so it's, it's, it's part of a larger component of infiltration, audience development, uh, and the like. Um, I think that, you know, there has always been a big debate among political scientists as to whether political advertising, whether it's TV or anywhere, really makes much of a difference. Um, I think, again, it, do, it does depend on, on which type of problem, which pathology we are trying to address through political advertising regulation. I think from the standpoint of platform regulation, this is an area where the platforms themselves are most responsible, right? Our colleague and, and also commissioner on this, uh, 
on this report. Alex Stamos has a great sort of pyramid of response. Oh, there he is. Alex, you should, he's, be, he's hovering. You should be up here. Uh, um, I just uh, cited you. But I'm, and, and for this sort of pyramid of responsibility that, that he has when he gives the, these talks, of, as, as that the platforms in particular, are when they're getting money for advertisements, they should be particularly responsible. When they're providing forums for individuals to speak to each other, then they are, they are less responsible. One last thing on this, which is that it is extremely difficult to define what a political advertisement is, not just in, in the typical way of thinking about like what is an issue ad versus a candidate ad, but also, and this is something that's you know, occurred in the last two weeks with the so-called branded content that Bloomberg's been paying for, which is that now it's becoming increasingly difficult to figure out where, how money is coming into the system, right? So it's all, we know what a political ad is if you put the content up on Facebook, but what if you're paying other people, right, who are influencers, to then uh, uh, issue these messages, right? And and so the the um, the internet enables a whole another kind of paid political content that we haven't uh, yeah. seen before. Stephen, anything you'd add to that? I'm not going to add anything. I think we should keep going because yeah. I think that was very uh, comprehensive. Good. Um, so you had talked, Stephen, about different citizen-led efforts. Uh, you mentioned. Um, uh, Verificado and Certeza, where there was a large civil society component. The report also highlighted some efforts in Kenya, the peace propaganda work there that was basically, as I understand it, texting tens of thousands of Kenyans with peaceful messages in partnership with local television shows. They were monitoring online calls to violence. They were reputing, uh, reporting abusive users to a text hotline, and this was sort of held up as a, a really successful model. I have been really skeptical of citizen-led efforts for at least four reasons. Really, obviously, hard to scale, some longer time horizons to impact. For a lot of these programs, like media literacy, then you have the engagement problem where you can't get half of Americans to vote in many elections. So the idea that, that they're going to spend a lot of time really diving deeper into who is the sponsor of a particular website. Um, and then the preaching to the choir problem of the kinds of people who are willing to volunteer to show up for these things tend to be more moderate by nature, and so you're not really dosing the, the target audience. But the Kenya experiment seemed really promising, and so my question is, do you think that citizen-led efforts like that can work? Uh, if so, where? And are there certain geopolitical, you mentioned po how polarized we are here, that some societies are more vulnerable, others more resilient. Are there certain geopolitical contexts where that can work and certain where it's sort of a lost cause? Right. Um, those are all great questions. I think some of your, I think your objections run in uh, two different ways. I mean, the, the thing about, um, I do have some things to say about sort of digital literacy. There, it's all in the details. But l let's just focus on the, on the sort of civil society responses. Um, there's a couple ways of answering it. It's like, you know, what would be the alternative if you hadn't had Verificado? You don't know what the alternative would have been. You know, uh, would it have been much worse? Same with Indonesia, which people think was, was successful. It, it goes to the heart of the fact that it's extraordinarily difficult to evaluate um, what the impact of these efforts are. Um, you know that, the, that it's happening. Um, you know that they, they are actually dealing with and and, 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 and showing that uh, there's a lot of disinformation out there. Um, uh, does it actually affect uh, overall voters and how they vote? You know, who knows? The, the, the evaluation is very difficult. Um, but I'll say this. The, the Kenya example is, is telling because it happened in an election that got an enormous amount of international attention because the previous election had led to you know, several thousand people dying and hundreds of thousands of people being displaced because of the violence. And so this was the first election after actually Kofi had, had negotiated and, and actually had mediated the settlement coming out of the, the previous election. And so um, the environment in which that effort took place was it's not just citizens coming together, trying to use technology, trying to blast out peace messages, trying to keep every, you know, violence down, reporting, hate speech. It was done in a context where a lot of people wanted that to succeed, right? And my understanding is this didn't happen the last time, um, of which you had an, an election that was an absolute mess, and whatever 
you know, whatever lessons you might have been able to, to take from the 2013 elections certainly weren't applied in part because maybe people thought, well, 2013 came out pretty good. Maybe we don't have to be as attentive in 2018, right? So um, there's that problem. I think on, uh, I, I think about Verificado a lot because I mean, we, we were in Mexico City and we asked, you know, you know how, do you, how do you evaluate? And it's a really tough question, but it comes down to me is that there is a value Obviously, partisans are not going to be swayed by learning something as disinformation, but not everybody is a partisan. I mean, we still live in a world where there are, are people who are not, you know, really blue and really red. So I hear. Right? You know? <laughs> and if that's the case, it seems to me to have an option um, that you trust to say, no, actually, that's, that really is disinformation, right? That, that really hasn't happened. Um, now, on the one last thing on where can this work? Um, the Verificado folks, as well as the Indonesia folks, say that it really helps for them to partner with traditional media, nonpartisan traditional media. All right, so now we have a big problem if we tried to do this in the United States. Know, it's right? still a thing. Yeah. Right? It's like, I can't see Fox News, you know, cooperating in the American Verificado, right? It's just, you know, uh, especially, although recently after the, you know, the, the internal memo saying, do you know that we are a spreader of disinformation? It's like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm glad there's some, there's some self-awareness there. Um, but no, I, I, I think this is, this is a real, real problem. Uh, and it goes back to, you know, you know, what makes you vulnerable? One of these things that makes you vulnerable is if you have partisan, hyper-partisan traditional media, yeah. you're really vulnerable to this stuff. Yeah, I think that's right. I continue to think that there is some mapping to be done of certain geopolitical contexts would really work for media literacy, others would really work for civil society efforts, and that you really need to get a little bit deeper into the levels of polarization, the extent of funding for public broadcasting, the health of the media, and, and then see what interventions can work. The, the, yeah. the, the sort of digital literacy, media literacy one, um, again, it's all in the details. Um, Sam Weinberg here does, you know, great work on this, but if you read his book, there's this nice section where he talks about the dangers of doing this in, in an already polarized environment, mm -hmm. right? Um, the standards of what is good media, I'm just speculating that, this, the, the, you know, the standards for what is good media to trust in Texas might be different from California? Maybe. Maybe. Aunt Mississippi, California. Um, and so are you just simply reinforcing sort of what powerful, you know, what powers that be already think of as good media, bad media, as opposed to accurate media? Um, and then there is, um, uh, you know, somebody in the psychology department here said, actually, when you opened the cyber center, he said, we, we don't need digital literacy training. We need uh, training in um, a, uh, unbiased ass assimilation of data and, and, you know, to understand cognitively what happens when we, when we approach data. Yeah, um, like a good behavioral science class on motivated reasoning. Yeah, or, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, instead of, you know, who benefits from this piece of information, the question should be, why am I predisposed to believe this piece of information? Yeah. Why do I so want to believe this piece of information? Yeah, the devil is in the details. There's a lot of different yeah, models. Let's jump on the, on yeah. the digital literacy stuff I, because, I, you know, when I, when I teach this in my class, I sort of come out against digital literacy, and I was like, but obviously I'm not, I, I'm not promoting illiteracy, you know? And it's, it's not like, but it's not, it's not be, look, we, I, I think that it's important that, um, you know, we have, we, we teach critical thinking, right? I mean, I think, but if teaching critical thinking were that easy, we would have done it long ago, right? And so part of the, you can think about the digital literacy issue at a kind of macro and micro level, which is, look, if you're talking about teaching critical thinking that, and, and, and being critical of what you see online, you run into several problems. First is, the thing you worry about is that you're creating distrust for all media, right? And so this is, this is always the concern about um, the Russian playbook, which is that, hey, well, now we're going to make people more and more and more discerning, which mm -hmm. means that um, they might be less likely to trust true things. That's what our colleague Jeff Hancock here in the social media lab oh. Uh, has has been finding. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe people need to be more discerning, but he's at least showing that people are getting better at spotting fake news, but they're becoming much more distrustful of true stuff 
uh, and it's actually a big, bigger gap. This that's is the a Peter Pomeranz stuff, like nothing is true, anything yeah, is possible, you know, kind and, of and Russia that, model. That's, that, yep. So that, that's one possibility. The second is, um, if, so, so here's the way I think about the disinformation problem, right? If you're the kind of person who's going to look, to see a source and then do research Right to figure out you whether, are not the problem. Then, yeah, yeah you, you're 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 fine, right? I mean, it's like you might still be in an echo chamber, and you're gonna you're gonna find stuff that supports your uh, beliefs. But but it can't be that that uh, the people who are enabled with these tools are then going to be doing the research. That isn't a, the question. Is for people who are not on social media in order to get political information, but nevertheless are persuaded by it because they sort of get at it inadvertently, what do you do with those folks, right? And so that, that's why I was talking about macro and micro digital literacy. Are there ways of packaging the information in such ways that you cue people to think critically about the stuff that they're seeing inadvertently? Um, uh, David Rand at MIT has some, has some ideas on this. Um, there, there are ways that, I mean, if you had to ask me, like, what's the big problem uh, with respect to Facebook and Twitter, and for that matter, Google search in terms of disinformation, it's the fact that they package information uh, homogeneously, right? That a, a, an op-ed from the New York Times, a Breitbart article, your kid's music video, uh, and, and, and communications from your friends are basically all packaged the same yeah. and come to you with the same kind of cues of legitimacy. Right, and so if we can figure out ways to add some of the cues that we have in the offline world into the online world, so that people could then be more discerning, I think that would that would be. And quite that's what important. Sally Lerman has been working on at the Trust Project at Santa Clara. Has been doing a lot of work with Google on how do we actually tag this at a sort of meta level, which has been interesting. Um, I have a question I'm dying to ask on prevalence uh, of disinformation, but want to open it up first to the audience and just see how many questions we have out there. I'm gonna start here and work our way over. <laughs> Is that, Alex, Alex should be up here. I don't know. I, th I, th I, thought, I thought you were actually, I thought you were actually supposed to be on this with us. All right. This is about a 100-page report. Is that all you produced? And I'm not <laughs> criticizing you, but I'm saying if there's a lot more, or if hopefully you have a URL so we can use your references, and go through the web, sure. I'd love to have the URL for this report. You got it. Okay. I'll give it. I mean, you should also just go to the Kofi Annan Foundation. There's a whole framing paper that I wrote. I can't remember how many pages it is. But if you want more to read on this, there's no shortage, I promise. <laughs> so yeah, go to, go, go to the Kofi Annan Foundation. Um, over, Look, we had use someone. the Google machine to find that. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, okay. you've got it. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> Alex. Oh. Hi, uh, my name is Alastair Lethal. I'm with the, the JSK uh, Knight Fellowship at the moment. I'm a, a BBC journalist as well, um, we uh, but I'm not show? working at the moment, um, <laughs> just in case you were. Uh, w what you said about uh, the, um, the literacy of the individual really interests me. Um, I, I look at regulation, I look at um, Facebook and the like and think, maybe they'll do something, but it's going to take a long time. In the meantime, it's got to be on the individual and how to encourage that literacy among not people doing courses at Stanford, but the, the most populist audiences, if you like. Do you have any thoughts about how to target, how to get individuals who don't understand the literacy, don't realize what their sources are, aren't asking those questions you pointed out, can be persuaded to or can be helped to learn to do that without ramming it down their throats? I personally believe that you have to embed it in the product, right? That, that you have to think about um, what kinds of cues and what kinds of triggers can you, can you actually embed in the product that then force people um, almost inescapably to start thinking critically about the information that they see. So, so uh, Dave Rand has this notion, I can think the acronym is CRT, like critical reflection theory, which is something that you know, if you, before each news item, you had some kind of cues as to the type of information that people are going to be uh, confronted with, and then essentially to think about that information differently than you would your kids' communication or, or something like that. There are other things that, that are done by the platforms, right? So they put in some friction, um, which forces you, you know, if they discover something that's been fact-checked to, to be false, and then you say, all right, do you really want to 
see this video, right? So, so it's not just coming at you uh, automatically, but then um, there's some friction, so then you're in, in the mindset. Because part of the problem sometimes, if you look at what Facebook had done originally, right, if they put a disputed flag over the false content, it actually led to greater engagement. But people were like, oh, false, let me read that, right? And so um, the, the, that's, that's part of the, the challenge. There's a lot of kind of UX research here. Um, I would, I would um, be very sort of in favor of a lot of taking the, like I said, the cues that we have in the offline world as to progeny and veracity and trying to fit them into the online world. Because what I, what I teach my class, right, is if, if you think about, if you go to a supermarket checkout stand and you see a newspaper there that says Hillary Clinton involved in pizza-related pedophilia scandal, right? You're like, I know what kinds of newspapers there are at the checkout stand, right? It's like, it's all tabloid stuff. But what happens in Facebook and Twitter and Google, right, is that they are all packaged in the same way. So it's coming at you in the same wrapping as every other kind of communication that you're getting from your friends. And so we need to figure out ways to provide sort of critical information right at the time of exposure to this stuff. But, but I do want to emphasize, I do not think expecting people to then do like dissertation research when they're seeing news on Facebook is the, is the way that this is going to be solved, right? It's, you cannot expect um, kind of a macro digital literacy program to have huge payoff in terms of uh, uh, dealing with the problem of disinformation, which is the inadvertent exposure, particularly from your social media feeds, of uh, problematic content. Thank you, this is so fabulous. Do you think the current Disclose Acts in California and the ones we're trying to do for the platforms are sufficient and are sophisticated enough to understand how the human brain works to realize how to, how to translate those cues? Or are we still in our infancy? We're still in our infancy. Was that clear? Yeah. yeah. And, and can we get IDO to help educate the people writing those bills, the disclosed bills, to know? You guys could help on that, I'm sure. Okay. I'm, I'm going to bias towards students as an yeah, educational right. institution. But <laughs> I'm not a student. <laughs> I'm an alumnus. Um, but thank you. Um, thank you for the invite. Uh, so um, we are... Uh, I'm currently at the Aspen Institute as a fellow, worked previously was at Facebook Integrity. Um, so my question is, we are trying to draft regulation actually to do exactly what was proposed, um, specifically on um, like confusing forms of political ads, things like dark ads, paid upranking, and things like the coordinated inauthentic behavior that Bloomberg is currently funding. Um, is thinking about these as ads a good idea, or should these be their own separate regulatory scheme? Well, so sure. uh, I don't know how, how far down the rabbit hole of like FEC regulations we should go, but let, let, me, let me put it this way, which is that um, there's obligations on the campaign side, right, when it comes to what they're spending money on. So even these influencers that, that Bloomberg is paying, they do have to disclose that kind of spending just as they do all kinds of other spending. Um, I, you know, from the Facebook or the platform perspective, you kind of understand their quandary, which is like, how do they really know whether, you know, if I am getting paid by a particular, you know, candidate to just spout stuff off on my Facebook feed, right? How do they know? Now they have rules about this, which is that you have to disclose. Now my view is that look, paid political, you know, paid political content on Facebook takes many forms. This is one of the forms that it takes. If you're going to require disclosure, it's going to be over and under inclusive. You're not going to get everything, but. It is, you know, it should not be a loophole that allows you to get around the political advertising transparency rules. So, so at a minimum, the paid political messaging, if, if they've discovered it, should be in the ad library where people can then say, all right, here's one way that we can figure out, you know, how money is leaking into the system, right? And, you know, I think that, that that's, that's the future too, right? We need to grapple with this problem now because as people start thinking about uh, the next generation of political advertising, it's going to be that kind of paid influence network. Now, but, but, but just to, to, so you appreciate how difficult this problem is, right? Where that kind of paid influencing ends and grassroots activity begins is a very difficult 
line to draw, right? Because if you are, you know, engineering a campaign and you're paying people to, to be part of that campaign or, or, you know, it's very hard to identify those folks. But, you know, if I'm paying, I don't know, who's a big Instagrammer, like, I don't know, Ashton Kutcher or something, uh, right, to, to, wow. to, to do, isn't he? <laughs> Might be a little dated, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Beach Boys? No, no. I, I, uh, so, yeah, so yeah, there we go. But the thing is, I didn't want to say like PewDiePie because he's like engaged in, you know, problematic content. But, but, but you know, if we, if we had a Nate Persley product placement in an Ashton Kutcher Instagram post, right? That is whatever that would mean. Uh, that, that, there would be so many amazing things about that. Yeah, yes. yeah. I, but I, that, that would be something. All right, it's, it's paid political activity. It's something that if they know that it's going on, it should be. Uh, revealed, right? They have they have certain types of regulations like that for commercial ads, right? And so if we could transpose them into politics, I think that's important. Um, Michelle, is there a way to get a chair up here for Alex? Alex, I thought you were not available, and you have so much to say on this. It's like paining me because I want to hear your perspective, <laughs> and you've got a mic in your hand, but if you could just move up here, it would be really, really, really great. Okay. There's a chair and then right give there. That, Alex yeah, Demos, the you, head of the Do we have group. another mic for other... For non-Alex. <laughs> Thank Everybody, you. Talk about someone who needs no introduction, right? So mm -hmm. Alex Damos, uh, head of the Internet Observatory here. Former CSO at Facebook and knows these problems inside and out. Do you have anything to add on this point about? I, well, I think the, the f so um, if you're interested in hearing the inside story, so this morning I got to wake up of uh, Stephen Levy's book of what happened inside of Facebook the last five years uh, released. Uh, so I did the Washington Read, Control F Stamos. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am apparently barrel chested. Uh, that is the, you know, it's like doe eyed Athena, fleet footed Achilles, barrel chested Stamos. That's mine. Uh, yeah. um, uh, anyway, uh, that's my Iliad uh, thing. But uh, um, thanks, Stephen. Uh, so, but other than that, I'm I'm okay. So you guys can read it now that I've, I've looked. Uh, it, so, but it, the interesting thing I think she covers a little bit is like one of the fundamental problems inside the companies is they do not want to be making judgments based upon content whenever possible, right? Especially in political situations, um, and they are desperate, desperate, desperate to not be making choices, decisions of what is true or false in a political campaign. Um, just a couple of facts. First, the vast majority of political disinformation is not fake news. It is making claims that are not falsifiable, right? So the vast majority of political disinformation, whether domestic or foreign, is the amplification of an interpretation of a true fact, right? So like the biggest thrust of the 2016 Russian campaign was to push the idea that Bernie Sanders got screwed in the primary. He probably did get screwed in the primary, but like it, it, it probably was not the reason why Hillary Clinton won, but it was based upon the true emails that were stolen by the Russians and then framed out in the media in a way that told the story that they wanted to be told. That's not fake news, it's not something that's falsifiable. And so like this focus on true or false is really kind of a media creation, because partially because it helps the media feel kind of morally superior to the tech companies, but it's not actually tied to the real problem. The real problem is really around authenticity of amplification. And so what the companies have tried to do is to come up with standards of what is appropriate behavior to make your voice bigger and to change the political discussion divorced from whether what you're saying is true or not. And that worked fine in the immediate aftermath of 2016 because the model of what people were doing in 2016 was in a world where these rules didn't exist and so they just did the basic stuff. Now that there are rules around authenticity, everybody is going right up to them. And the Bloomberg example I think is the best one of where Bloomberg's team has effectively very deep, gone very deep into the rules that Twitter and Facebook and other companies have built and they're going right up to the edge and basically daring the companies to do something. Um, but certainly other, other groups, both domestic and foreign, are going to be doing the same things. And so I think, to me, a big question is like, how do you define what is authentic behavior? Um, advertising is easy because it is clearly inauthentic amplification. That is the whole point of advertising. Um, but for these things of like, yo, know, if somebody posts, uh, I love Mike Bloomberg, and they happen to also be paid by the campaign, right? Like, at, that is just a normal part of campaigning. Like everybody who knocks on your door on the day of voting that's being paid to do that, they are both being paid and they are probably legitimately a supporter of that candidate. Um, and how do you disentangle those two things I think is super hard, is extremely hard for a tech platform that knows nothing about the back end relationships between these people and any campaigns. Um, so I think it, it, it is a difficult 
problem. Um, but then also perhaps one of the ones we have to live with in a free society, right? Like, I think that's also the discussion that doesn't happen that much, which is like some problems you don't want to solve because solving them is actually much more authoritarian and creates like levers of control in our political system that we don't want to exist at all because you, you're not sure whose hands are going to be on those levers. And I think that's something that we, you know, that Stephen did a good job of, of having, um, a small C conservatism in the report of let's not be utopians that believe that through you know, these great people getting together and, and bestowing upon especially the developing world ideas of how democracies can work better, that you can create systems that fix all of these problems. Some of them are just issues you have to deal with if you're gonna live in a democracy. That's kind of my, my spiel. Anyway. Thank you. Others, again, um... oh, thanks Michelle. Uh, Steve, I want to come back to the report real quickly. You uh, began with a comment about a major source of disinformation is the President of the United States. Disinformation has been a policy of the government of the United States over many years, CIA externally, COINTELPRO, FBI internally. Aren't you then looking in the wrong direction in the recommendations? Why expect the government to be a regulator of disinformation? And why expect companies whose profit model depends on disseminating all sorts of things and getting people to look at it to be the regulators of disinformation. And if you don't look there, then where are you looking? <laughs> so, uh, again, the, this is a very narrow focus on electoral integrity, right? Um, of which you can narrow intensely into this is about uh, candidates, the polling places, all kinds of stuff. Or you can also ratchet, ratchet it out in domestic politics to talk about um, you know, the set of beliefs that are necessary for democracy to go forward. Um, governments use propaganda all the time. Governments use disinformation all the time. Usually uh, democracies, you hope that they're aimed at other countries that may be your enemies. Um, sometimes, apparently, it's your friends, but, but um, yeah, I think all citizens have a fundamental understanding that governments use disinformation as a tool of foreign policy. I think that as Democrats, we ought to be outraged if parts of government or candidates or people who are in power are using propaganda and disinformation systematically and weaponizing it um, to actually sort of destroy the norms that are necessary for democracy to be sustained. I, I think that's a different thing. Um, you know, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, the Oxford Internet Institute, when they do their yearly tabulation of who is doing, um, you know, weaponized disinformation, the United States is always in there. Um, we're doing it towards Cuba. We're doing it in Iran. We're doing it in a number of places, right? Um, but yeah, I think you should be particularly outraged if uh, individuals who hold office are doing that to their own citizens. Yeah, I, I think it's problematic. I mean, we're, we're starting to get a hint on this on the now politicization of the DNI report, mm -hmm. right? That we hear a leak that from, it sounds like Kipsy from the House Intel, that the, Russia is involved in 2020 and they're backing Trump. And then you hear another leak from the executive branch. No, they're backing Bernie. And then you have the national security advisor say, I haven't seen any of it. But he didn't say it wasn't happening. He just basically said, I, didn't, I haven't read anything. So, um, <laughs> but like, it's starting to get really scary of what you can do if you control the intelligence community of your capability yeah. to weaponize just the thought of these issues against your opponent. Um, my hope is the Democrats don't mention it tonight in the debate, but I think that's unlikely, right? That they will do the work of the Russians for them by taking what might have been a DNI report that's like there's 30 fake accounts on Instagram and turning it to like a 20 minute discussion tonight. It'll be interesting to see whether Democrats can avoid the bait or not. I think I've got the mic here. Um, I had a couple of points. I think he's right. How can we trust the government when they're constantly doing things that you say we should be outraged about? We need civil society entities like the ones Larry Diamond describes in his books to take care of this problem. And I think uh, there's an issue with regulating all of this political free spe speech in view of Supreme Court decisions in Buckley versus Vallejo and Citizens United. I don't know if that's a fool's errand because of those Supreme Court decisions or if we need to really be active about reversing them. And one final suggestion is that we need humility and we need to, com we need to complement that humility with discernment. 
and I think it's a heavy lift to ask everybody to be discerning, but it's one we have to do. All these solutions you have are fantastic, but they're whack-a-mole. So that's just yeah. my, my points. Well, thank you for the question. I just taught Buckley versus Vallejo yesterday in my uh, uh, campaign finance class, so um, how much do you want to know on this? Uh, the, 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 <laughs> Not so, that much. Yeah, right. Basically, the you know most so there are certain types of regulations, like for example, defining what a political advertisement is, which is not a problem under Buckley versus Vallejo. Um, some bot, bot, one of the things people don't realize that Citizens United, uh, for all of its controversy as a five-four decision dealing with corporate advertising, actually eight of the nine justices in that decision supported disclosure, right, as um, constitutionally uh, appropriate regulation. And so almost all of what we recommend is disclosure-based. The two things that are a little bit different are mandating what the minimum segment size would be for, for political ads. That might go up to the constitutional line. It, it depends on, um, a lot of these recommendations are for countries, right, that are not uh, the U.S. Um, and then um, there, the, so the, the bot disclosure could be a kind of interesting question um, that uh, I was thinking of having for my First Amendment course as final exam, but now I've you know just revealed it. So, uh, uh, for, but but you know, can you require people to disclose automation? I think you can at least requ require the companies to have some policy on that. But yeah, we're, we don't say, for example, ban political spending, you know, regular, or any of that kind of stuff because um, it would be unconstitutional in the U.S. And it's also I mean, the kind of thing that different cultures have different views on, on regulating political advertising. Um, we've got someone up here, Michelle. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, so this is a question, and well, thank, thank you everyone for all of your work and coming up with these ideas and proposals. Um, I just had a question for Stephen because I, I've noticed you often use this word disinformation and you're just coming at it from a blank slate and not being too familiar with the term. It does strike me as odd because even disinformation would in theory contain information and so it almost sounds a little Orwellian like this, uh, this notion that there is proper information then there is anti-information and I just wanted to give you perhaps the chance to describe a little bit what fits into your view of disinformation. Um, in, especially given um, Mr. Stan or uh, Al I think it was Alex Alex's comments that uh, a lot of this is non-falsifiable and is really just a, a matter of opinion. Okay. So it's a great question. Um, so I think we 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 draw distinctions between misinformation and disinformation, and it's usually intentional, right? That there is a, there there is a use of uh, information to deceive, right? Um, and in our you know in the report we say um, there's lots of disinformation. It's not particularly interesting the fact that there's lots of disinformation. Where we're particularly concerned is what we really what we call weaponized disinformation which is the use of the sort of purposive, coordinated uh, use, especially of inauthentic uh, voices behind it to create a narrative, right? And in our, in our realm, an, a narrative that will have detrimental effects on the integrity of election, right? So um, again, lots of disinformation, but when you have groups that are very purposeful about a narrative that they know is either going to undermine the mutual security that's necessary for an election to go forward, um, or just simply, there, there, there is disinformation. I mean, information is, here are the polling places for tomorrow, and th these are the hours that they're open. And then the disinformation is, actually, you know, a bunch of those are closed and they're going to be open on Thursday instead of on Tuesday. And that, so don't come, go tomorrow because tomorrow you're going to find them closed. That's, you know, pretty clear. There is information and disinformation. So that's, that's what we do in the report. But it's actually really a challenging question that comes up again and again, uh, especially it, in an online environment where I might spread something intentionally false and then it gets out there and the next 
people who are promulgating it obviously may not have an intention to deceive. It's also a huge problem, and this comes back to the prevalence question that I had wanted to touch on with you guys, which is in even starting to talk about how much quote unquote disinformation is out there. And, and Alex, this kind of comes back to your point around a lot of the, you know, do we really want to solve this problem? Because a lot of the solutions run into all kinds of free speech or other sort of norms and values challenges. And there's this assumption that there's a ton of disinformation out there. But then when you actually start to look at the studies, uh, Genskow, Matt Genskow here at the GSB said, okay, well maybe on average one, you know, uh, citizens in the U.S. recalled one, um, saw and recalled one fake news story in the lead up to the 2016 elections. And then I think it was Rand and everybody at MIT that said something like 27% of Americans saw some kind of disinformation in the lead up to 2016. And then Oxford Internet Institute said more than half the news online leading up to the elections in the US was junk news. And a lot, right. And so a lot of this comes into these definitional questions of, well, what do we really mean? Is it just that the you know, that the entire content is fake? Is it that the headline is sort of alarming and inflammatory? And how much of it is out there, I think, really matters in terms of how far we're willing to yeah. go in the solutions we are considering. What do you guys think about how much is really out there and how much it matters? I mean, so part of it goes back to definitional, right? So on the disinformation, I think you can separate information and influence operations from disinformation. So when you talk about disinformation, you're labeling a specific piece of content, right? That can be part of an information operation where you have a organized adversary that is trying to influence the information environment in a way to their geopolitical benefit. We can say that that's bad whether or not there's disinformation involved or not, right? So I think on that, that prevalence, the, the vast, vast majority of this issue is domestic all around the world, right? If you are looking at a piece of online disinformation, it is probably coming from your government or from a political group in your country. Like all of the numbers show that the, that the action between countries versus inside of countries is orders of magnitude off, which makes total sense, right? If you think about the number of people who are politically motivated inside of a country to influence their own election versus the number of countries that are running organized groups. Um, I mean, I, there's some, I mean, there's a lot of these studies that I, I like the Oxford number sounds extremely high to me. Um, part of it is like the Overton window has been blown up of what is acceptable political discourse. And there's a certain set of people that kind of want to put that back. Um, and so they define of everything outside of the old Overton window as junk news, or you know, highly biased or whatever. And I don't think it's necessarily a horrible thing in the long run that we have a world in which there are, uh, you know, there are political, that you can get access to political speech and news sources that perhaps are not lined but are much more biased, but are, are outside of what was considered mainstream 30 years ago, right? Yeah. Like, and I don't think that's actually, there's some people that just seem to assume that that's true, and most of those people seem to work for the New York Times, uh, that assume that that's just like a bad thing, that they no longer control the information environment, but I don't think we should accept that framing. Um, and so I think our framing should be much more about how do we survive as a democracy within, a, within the constraints of um, not everybody being within it. Because like, the other thing is like, everybody talks about this, this like, magical time before there's this information when your you know, um, rust belt steel worker came home from a long day of work and he laid out his FT, his economist, and his Wall Street Journal. <laughs> um, and then like, synthesized an answer from all that while listening to CBS and PBS at different ears, right? <laughs> yeah. And like, that's just never existed. No, what happened was like, Walter Cronkite told you what to think. And, and it was like up to the 45 middle-aged white men who controlled the media to control, to decide what was legitimate. And so in this world, you have nativists uh, and populists like Donald Trump who are able to push ideas that were not, would not make it onto the four networks and in the five newspapers 30 years ago. You also have the ability for democratic socialists like Bernie Sanders. Like Bernie Sanders does not exist without the internet, I'm sorry. But we do not come this close to somebody who calls himself a socialist being this close to a Demo the Democratic nomination in a world where 20 corporations control the media. You also, it's not like Me Too and Black Lives Matter that those weren't issues 40 years ago, right? It's not like women were treated great uh, and that African Americans had no problems with the police. It's just that the middle-aged white guys that ran the news didn't really care and so it didn't make it out. And so I think like we have to, we're in a world that we have to accept the fact that 
we have much more access to much broader sets of opinions, and that is on us, and we should not look to reestablish that Overton window through aggressive moves through the center. And, and, and I think that comes to the prevalence argument because so many of these prevalence decisions are around people kind of coming up with arbitrary decisions of what is good versus bad. Yeah. yeah, and I'd like to really underscore a point that you make, and then we're almost out of time, so I want to leave one minute for each of you guys to just highlight any sort of final thoughts or takeaways that you think are most... Oh, do we want to get... Well, you have, you have yeah, the mic, let, so let's let, get, let, let, let's let, get let, this let, one let, last question let, in. Question. Okay, thank you. I'm John Mashey. Um, uh, quick question for you on uh, critical thinking and digital literacy, and real specific... Uh, and I'll explain the question, and I'll explain why it worries me, okay. which is, where is that, and how is that taught at Stanford, or what do you expect coming in? And the reason I ask is I occasionally do a guest lecture for John Wyant's class on in international environmental policy. I study disinformation flows around climate and tobacco, okay, and the industry and the money flows and everything. And I'm sort of in there to help um, sort of inoculate them. Okay, right? And I ask them, you know, do you have a critical thinking class? And I get a whole lot of different answers. Okay, right? So the question is, where do students learn that? Here. Law school. Law school. <laughs> I think every school will say the same that thing. That helps the undergraduates a whole lot. All of you should come. No, and, and, and I open up my classes. Up. It's funny because you know, I teach a First Amendment class, which I open up to the undergrads as well, okay. and, and also my Law of Democracy class. So I, I'm obviously being cheeky there, but you know, there's, uh, you know, there, there, there is, um, and depending on which which department you're in, right? There's going to be different uh, types of skills that are taught there. I mean, obviously in the law, we we do, I think, almost overcorrect on our skepticism, right? But but uh, I think it, you know, whether it's the methods courses in political science or um, some of these other things. I mean, Alex teaches this incredible class on trust and safety online, um, which is not about that per se, but it's about giving the tools, particularly to the engineers, to think about the, uh, the real problems that he saw in industry. All right, lightning round of final comments. 30 seconds remaining. Last thought, Stephen, that you'd want to underscore? Well, I, I actually think the last half hour uh, demonstrates why this was such a dif difficult topic to take on by a commission, um, where uh, new research is coming out every day, um, there's all kinds of opinions, um, and sometimes they run across you know, the front pages of major newspapers without a lot of evidence. Um, so for me, part of, the, part of the exercise was in just trying to step back. And what's, what's so telling to me is we really do have an enormous amount of anxieties about the health of our democracy for good reasons. Um, and uh, I think the tendency has been to place all of these anxieties on this technology or set of technologies, these de digital technologies. And my conclusion after the year is that, you know, if you got rid of these technologies tomorrow, um, there would be two sets of people who would be really happy, and those would be teenage parents and, um, you know, authoritarian leaders, right? Um, and that. Um, the, the struggle that we're going to, you know, be going through is how do you, how do you navigate the, these technologies in ways that it can bolster democracy? And just one last thing is, you know, because your, your last question really triggered it for me. Um, I hate it when I when I when I read these headlines or or op-eds that start, you know, democracy is drowning in disinformation, mm -hmm. and it's just like, absolutely not. We're we're not. Um, we probably have more information. Uh, at our disposal than ever before in history. Um, moreover, because um, there's often a, an addendum that says, we can't have democracy when citizens can't agree on facts. And for me, that's like, absolutely not. Citizens for a long time haven't agreed on facts. Um, and I can give you like, you know, all kinds of examples. It's, and again, I come back to the point is, you need democracy precisely because citizens don't agree on facts. Thank you. Um, any last thought? We are at time, but anything you're dying to communicate before we close this? Uh, yeah, just two quick things. One, I think in our democracy, domestically in the U.S., we have to be much less quick to say that people disagree with us because they've been fooled. 
right? And not because they actually have equities that are not being balanced by our side, right? I think so much of what has happened in the last four years has been people reacting to the election of a certain person and saying, why in God's name could 46 million people vote that way? It must be because they were tricked somehow. And I think having like a basic empathy for people that we disagree with to that it's not just that they've been poisoned or tricked, but maybe they, there's some reason that they're acting the way and they're acting is one of the ways out of this democratic spiral. Um, and then internationally, the, the truth is the vast majority of this problem, I think, is much, much worse outside of the developed Western democracies. Um, and so we, we have to be stop being so nasal giving in the United States about just talking about these issues of like how they affect us. So if you go to io.stanford.edu, that's our website. We have a report on Russian disinformation activity in Africa. We have a report on what happened in Taiwanese election. We're going to be posting a blog post in Poland, um, which is an incredibly critical election to the future of Eastern Europe. Other places is actually much more critical, and, and it's it's okay for those things to be important, even if they don't reflect on our election here. Yeah. I was actually right. going to make that last point, which is to say that it's also important to not think about other countries' disinformation problem or hate speech problem in the same way that we think about it in the U.S. The, the technological environment, the media environment is quite different. So, for example, you know, it may be we focus a lot on WhatsApp, on, on uh, Facebook. Twitter and the like, but WhatsApp is often the most important, you know, mode of communication in the developing world, um, as well as, you know, wh what does it mean when in some countries Facebook is the internet, right, where they don't have the plural plurality of voices that you see in the American internet space. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I, I thought you were on. I, I, I,